I'm here today with Julia Cage, Professor of Economics at Sciences Po and an INET grantee with forthcoming work on the relationship between money and politics in France. But today we're here to discuss her new book, Saving the Media, published by Harvard University Press in 2016. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. When I think about your title, Saving the Media, the questions that occur to me are saving it for whom and saving it from whom? Saving the media for whom? I would say for all the citizens that care about democracy, mm -hmm. that care about information, and that want to be informed at the time they vote. So I think the media they provides a very important public good, that information is this public good, and that we all need independent information as citizens. Then why do we need to save the media? I guess because they suffer a lot. They suffer from an economic crisis, and this appears with a decline in their revenues, and especially the very strong decline in advertising revenues. Mm -hmm. And more, apart, more importantly, this is not so much about the decrease in revenues, that about the decrease in how much media outlets invest in mm. producing information. Mm. And what is striking is a very strong decrease in the total number of journalists, either in the United States or in France or elsewhere in Europe, and the decrease in the average size of media outlets' newsroom. Mm -hmm. And with less journalists, you produce less information. Yeah, I understand in America, from uh, my observations, that the number of investigative journalists who do deep, exploratory, long-form work has gone down massively because no one can afford to pay for it, uh, given the declining revenues you described. Because nobody is willing to pay for it. There is a story of revenues, mm -hmm. but there is also a story of profitability. What we observed for years with profitable media outlets, and especially with public companies, is that they were cutting in their expenses, and especially in the bureau abroad, or in investigative journalism, despite the fact that they were still making money. So you mean so public I companies publicly listed on stock publicly exchanges? Publicly listed companies yes. that want to ma maximize their, their profitability. Yeah. So as of today, it's true that they are losing money, and this is another part of the story, and they are suffering even more than before. But they were cutting in their newsroom before they, they lost money. What they wanted was to maximize profit. Mm -hmm. So they react to the decline in advertising revenues by declining the expenses, even if the profit were still positive. Yes. Now, in your book, you look at what you might say, how to heal this, this disease. And I know in the United States, a couple of nonprofit media organizations, most profoundly ProPublica, have stepped forward. And ProPublica has won a Pulitzer Prize and other many awards for investigative journalism. Why, what are the structures of organization of a media company that you think would be most healthy and most likely to survive in this in this challenging era? I think non-profit is part of the solution. And ProPublica is a good example of a non-profit media outlet that is successful. Mm -hmm. Now ProPublica is one example, but it does not reflect the reality. If you look at the average size of the newsroom of non-profit media outlets, they tend to be very small, mm -hmm. less than five journalists, sometimes just one or two. The reason why it is the case it's because it is very hard to create a media outlet as a non-profit foundation in the United States mm -hmm. because of the IRS, because of the tax code. So if you want to be a charitable foundation in the US, you need to qualify to what is called 501c3 status. Yes, and which I know this one <laughs> <laughs> And to get this status, you need to satisfy an educational purpose of the society. So at the very beginning, a couple of years ago, when media were applying to this status, they got it. And then the IRS changed its position, and now it's saying no, more or less, to all the media organizations that try to apply. Mm. Mm. What is happening is that in the US, the majority of the media outlets that are considered as foundations are part of universities, because this was the best way to get access to this status that is linked to education. So a university is going to create a media outlets, and then the media outlets would take advantage of uh, the charitable deductions. Mm -hmm. I think it should be made much more simpler. I think it should be possible for any media organization that provide information as a public good. This is not about entertainment. 
this is about information, to apply to the IRS and to get this 501c3 status. Mm -hmm. And I think information should be one of the things that can be considered for tax deduction the same way as education is. So I know that a number of senators in the US they tried to pass some bills in order to have this. It was not successful, and I hope it will be successful in the future. In particular, because in the US, we still have this debate on how much money the government should invest in the media. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at the US compared to the UK or France, on average, you spent $4 per capita a year on financing both public and private media. In Nordic countries, it's above like 100 euros a year per capita. In the UK, in France, it's around like 80, 90 uh, euros per capita. Mm. So in the US, you spend much less, despite the media are suffering as strong a crisis than in European countries. How do the American organizations pick up the spending? You, you talk about per capita spending. Does that uh, include imputed advertising revenues as well? No, no, this is just public spending. Public spending, gotcha. on, on the media, Understood. that is very, Understood. very low. Because the uh, government subsidies to the media are super low in the US, you just have some like reduced postal rate mm -hmm. and more or less nothing more. While at the end of the day, in the 18th century, the United States were the very first country to create subsidies to the media. So this was part of the tradition of American newspapers. In fact, if you look at the history of American newspapers compared to French newspapers, a lot of People, historians, are arguing that American newspapers, they were doing much better in the 19th century than in Europe. Because in France, for example, you needed to pay some specific taxes as a newspaper to be published. While in the US, newspapers, they were receiving f some money from the government. And this helped, you know, developing a high quality uh, newspaper industry. Mm. And as of today, you have people in media scholars like Michael Schutzen, for example, that say that we need to put more money, more public money again in the media industry. And the non-profit form is an efficient way to invest public money into the media because through non-profit, you won't have government intervention, which is always the risk, you know, when the government put money into the media. Yes. Through non-profit, you invest money thanks to the charitable deduction. So citizens, they choose the media they want to fund mm -hmm. and then the state has to pay. Mm -hmm. But he mm -hmm. has no decisions to take. Well, we see in the United States a great concentration of income and wealth in recent years. Uh, and we see people like Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post. Is that a, a form of philanthropy or is a 501c3 with donors like Jeff Bezos a more healthy structure in your mind? I think we will have the same problem in the two cases when we have Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post directly, or Jeff Bezos setting up a foundation with a 501t3 status mm -hmm. and buying the Washington Post through the foundation. Mm -hmm. One of the things we need to save the media from are these new tycoons. Bezos is one of them. Carlos Slim through mm -hmm. the New York Times is another one. We have like dozens of examples in Europe and others in the US. Mm -hmm. These new shareholders, they don't come from the media industry. They are making their money and wealth from other industries, either the telecommunication sector or e-commerce, for example. They don't buy media outlets to make money. That's for sure. The profitability of the industry today is very low. Mm -hmm. What they buy through media outlets is that they buy power. They buy influence. Mm -hmm. And whether they buy these outlets directly or they put money into a foundation to buy these outlets, this would be the same issue mm -hmm. in terms of powers. Mm -hmm. This is why, why what I say in my book is that non-profit is part of the solution, but we need to go further. And in my book, what I propose is the NMO, the Non-Profit Media Organization. That is a new legal framework for media organization at the intersection between non-profit foundations and shareholder companies. Mm -hmm. In this model, what is key is that you will reduce the power, basically the voting rights of the main outside shareholders. So what I propose, for example, is that above a certain share of capital, 
your voting rights are only going to increase, let's say, by one third with any additional capital share. Mm -hmm. So you may put money into the media, but we want to preserve the independence of the journalist, so we are going to reduce your voting rights. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, I want to give more voting rights to the journalist and to the readers. So I am aiming to a system in which both the readers and the journalists will be shareholders. They will invest money in the media industry, but their voting rights are going to increase more than proportionally than their capital shares. And you will have a more democratic sharing of power within the newsroom, and this will be a way to protect the independence of the journalist against the influence yes. of these new tycoons. Yeah, there was a long tradition in the United States of examining uh, media monopolies and concentration. Uh, the uh, Ben Bogdikian, who wrote at Berkeley, was a very famous uh, proponent of breaking up media monopolies. But you seem to be going to inside the organization and how the incentives are, which you might call, diffused or not concentrated in order to liberate the journalist to practice his craft with, how you say, with his integrity and, and not fear of the shareholders. And I think that's an interesting innovation. I'm reminded uh, in the 1950s, the famous writer for The New Yorker, A.J. Liebling, he said, uh, free press, it's a wonderful thing. Everyone should own one. <laughs> but that, that's true. In fact, I, I have been campaigning for this NMO, non-profit media organization in France, like uh, for one year. And then some, like newspapers, media outlets, pure internet players, very often these are newspapers created online, they try to raise money through crowdfunding or crowdsourcing campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they ask me to come. So now I, I get used to talk with people and I was trying to find a way to convince citizens that they should put money into these media outlets. And the kind of example I had was to say, let's say that a pure internet player needs $1 million. $1 million is either a tycoon buying more influence, buying more journalists, buying more power, mm -hmm. or 1,000 people putting 1,000 euros each and being able to get access to independent, free information. And I think for a citizen, this is not a very high price to pay, especially because 1,000 euros if the media is a normal company, you need to pay the price. But if it is a non-profit media organization with charitable deduction, just pay one third. Yes. So at the end of the day, it's three hundred dollars. Not a very high cost. And this is the price for independence. Mm. So us as citizens, we also have a role to play and we also have to take our responsibility. And if we want a free press, we need to buy it, we need to fund it. And I think that we also need to fight to be shareholders, to have voting rights, to sit on the board and to be part of the game to protect the independence of the journalist. Mm -hmm. In uh, the uh, world of monetary economics, they talk of Gresham's Law how bad money drives out good money. Silver would drive out gold, and debased currencies uh, always drive out the more uh, solid or valuable. In this instance, does bad media drive out good by being free? Free of lower quality, but nonetheless destabilizing of the organization that provides high quality. Uh, is, is that part of the challenge of this time? I think it's the case because if you put money into a media and you don't need to have profit because what you are looking for is just influence, then you are going to decrease mm. the mm. price in a sense. You are ready like, to, 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 to lose money. This is unfair competition. And this is especially unfair competition for the new entrant. Uh, when we talk about competition, a lot of people think that with the internet, we should not care so much about concentration. Because given that the entry cost is zero, it's very easy to set up a media outlet. Mm -hmm. And de facto, you have an incredibly high number of like new media outlets, website, this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, the concentration online, if you look at the total audience share of the like five top websites producing information in the US, is much higher than the concentration offline. Mm. So then if you put a lot of money to have a very high audience, more or less you kill any possibility for an independent media outlet 
to be created from scratch and to get audience on the internet. Mm. So I think the danger is even like more important today with the internet than it was in the past. Mm. Especially because on top of it, you have a lot of like media owners or regulators that say, we don't need to do anything because look at economists. They say, when the entry cost is zero, there is no issue with the monopoly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No entry and barrier, but that's a different, my son just finished a book. Uh, I'll do a promo for him too, from uh, Paul Gray McMillan, and it's called The Making of New Monopolies. And it's essentially about these network monopolies that are founded on the internet that don't arise from entry barrier or regulation from the government prohibiting entry, but they become a natural uh, through the volume they create, say like eBay between buyers and sellers. And in the media world, I think that uh, that kind of network monopoly is, is also a possible structure. Emily Bell, who was part of the Guardian team for years, mm -hmm. she wrote a very important article, I think, in the Columbia Journalism Review. And this was part of the story. She told us something that we know when we study the media, but citizens they tend to forget. More than half of the people today, when they consume news, they consume it either through Google News, Yahoo News, aggregators, or through Facebook, through Twitter. They don't go directly on the website mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of the local or national daily newspapers, weekly newspapers they want to consume. Now we have five to six players that have the power to decide what we can get access to or not get access to. These new players in the internet era, they are even more powerful than the newspapers themselves. Mm -hmm. And she gave a very interesting example, I think, is that if today you are the American government and you want to fight against ISIS, you are not going to call the publisher of the New York Times to know what should be published or not within the newspapers against the propaganda. You are going to call the head of Twitter or the head of Facebook mm -hmm. to shut down pages or to close accounts. So we are in, an, in a world in which there are only monopolies for the media. There are monopolies on the production side, yes. those who own the media outlets that pay for the journalists. And there are also big monopolies on the distribution side. And I think this is a dangerous time for yes. democracy. There's a uh, young man, Eli Pariser, who founded, co-founded with some others a company called Upworthy. And he has given talks like in the TED Talk Forum and others about the danger of these concentrated, which you might call hubs, because in addition to uh, being able to filter what you see and don't see, they use various feedback algorithms so that you only hear those things that you already like, that they've detected. And so everybody gets their, what you might call biases confirmed, and it disables democratic discourse. So I think, I think there's lots of, in these new structures with the advent of the internet, there's a lot to learn and there are a lot of dangers, what we might call lurking on the side. In a sense, this is why in my book with the non-profit media organization, I want the readers to be part of the media outlet, of the newspapers or of the website. Mm -hmm. This will create a link with the brand. If you give money to a media outlet, then you are going to consume the information you produce directly. You are not going to go through Google, through Yahoo, or through all these aggregators that are going to use your past behavior to determine what you want to consume. You are going to go directly on the website yes. to get access to the news. And this news is going to be given to you through the news providers. And I think this is also something that is very important. And the fight for the readers to be shareholders, to get voting rights, to be part of the independence of the journalist, it, it would create a new link. So obviously, if you look at like the, the, the numbers of people that visit, you know, Yahoo News every day, I'm not aiming at reaching like this thousands, uh, hundred million people, you know, in the in the U.S. Uh, it would be very good, but I think this would be a dream. And you won't have, you know, like 300 million people that are going to invest into the media. But those people that were used to, con to consume legacy media and to buy for news through legacy media, 
before the internet era, I think that those people, they are ready to invest in the mm -hmm. media organizations mm -hmm. and to become shareholders. On top of that, young people, those that are born in the internet era, that are used to crowdfund, that are used to crowdsource, that are used to be on the internet all the time, I think part of them, we can also convince them that it is important to yes. pay for information. Yes. This is not that these guys, a lot of people say, oh, young people, they are selfish, they don't want to pay for it. But we never ask them to pay. We gave them information for free since the time they were born. But if we were to ask them to pay for it, I'm sure we could convince them to be part of this big story and to protect the independence of the media. Well, I think the first stage in this is exactly what you've done. You've written the book to take what you might call is an unconscious environment and raised it to the conscious level. The second dimension, of course, is once you start to pay, to perceive and feel the increase in quality, which validates you're making that expense and starts to change the model. But from my standpoint, uh, there's a man in modern media in America named Seth Godin, who I've met once and is very, very brilliant. And he talks about how the most important thing you can do with your life is think about what the most important things to focus on are. And I, I myself want to applaud this work of yours because I think you are both innovative, raising things in ways that others have not. You're focusing on an important issue, and you are providing a very great service. And, and here at INET, we're very grateful for the work that you do. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us.